we're going to be starting a new series that I'm calling Identity. Uh, if you guys turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. We see here very clearly that as we look into this, we're going to be looking at some interesting things here. Um, this study is going to take us to the end of the year. I purposely created this series for the rest of the year before we get into our new book in the new year, which I don't know what book to go into next, but I figured to take a break since we went through 12 chapters of Ecclesiastes. Uh, I figured, you know what, let's kind of have a little, a little series, a mini series here for the next few weeks, and I have came up with this ser series called Identity. Who are you really? That's what, that, that's what I'm kind of looking at. Um, so let's read verses. Uh, actually, even though we're looking at verse 17, that's going to be the main text for us. I'm going to go ahead and read, though, verses uh, 12 through um, verse uh, 20. 2 Corinthians 5, at verse 12. For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf, that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God, or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, and that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Why is identity important? That's the question. According to the goodtherapy.org, this website, they said this about identity. Not having a strong sense of self or struggling with identity issues may lead to depression, anxiety, and other psychological health problems in addition to even physical health problems. Our world says if you struggle with your identity, you are going to have problems with you're going to have problems emotionally and physically. That's the way the world looks at this when it comes to identity. Now when we talk about identity, perhaps there are some here that probably think of Bruce Jenner. When you think about identity, of course, he struggled with gender identity. That was, his, that, was his, that was his struggle. In fact, Jenner, most of you guys know, announced earlier this year that he intended to live the rest of his life as a woman. In fact, just this past week in New York, he was honored as one of Glamour Magazine's Women, women, of, the, uh, women of the Year. And it's interesting because they actually interviewed this, uh, him when he got this, uh, this award or this recognition he said this, and I quote, I came to the conclusion that, you know what? Maybe this is why God put me on this earth to tell my story and maybe make a difference in the world. What a great opportunity in life to have. I find that interesting because he included God in this old equation. He's basically saying that, listen, the, the reason why I'm who I am today, according to him, this is his identity, maybe God put me on this earth to tell my story, to tell people, this is my identity, and maybe God will help others through me. Now, it is a great opportunity as, as, as Christians to influence or impact lives uh, through our identity, but our identity in Christ. In fact, we see that some people in our world today, when it comes to identity, they try to identify themselves perhaps by their jobs or whatever they do. That's kind of like how they're identified. Uh, another, another area that they actually identify themselves is in their jobs, their position. You know, their jobs, or I'm sorry, their degrees, rather. Whatever degree you get, that's your identity. If you get a, a PhD, you're not going to be called what? Doctor. You know, my wife has two master's degrees, 
And she said, you know what, I don't want a PhD. I'd rather be called master than doctor. I said, I like that. I like that. I like that. Why can't we call her master, right? Anyways, but some people identify themselves by their income level, how much they make. Are they poor? Are they, are they rich? Some search for their identity in relationships. And you see this, uh, this variety of, of search when it comes to identity. And when it comes to the Christian, Christians can struggle with their identity as well. Uh, you know, why am I here? I know, I know Jesus, I, I'm saved, but, but what is my purpose on this side of heaven? They tend to kind of get lost. Who am I? What is my purpose? The question is, who does God say we are? That's the question I want to answer today. And actually, for the rest of the year, to be honest with you, that's the overall theme of this series that I'm calling Identity. Who are you really? Now, we can either let the world tell us who we are, or we let God tell us who we are. That's your choice. And the question is, who exactly are we in Christ? Who are we in Christ? Well, the Christian faith is a very deep faith, yet it's very practical too. It's very practical, and I don't assume that every Christian in this room and just in general pray all the time, read and study their Bibles all the time. Perhaps they don't do any of that stuff, and when they don't, they become kind of shallow in their faith. They don't really know who they really are in Christ because they're not giving themselves an opportunity to read the Bible, to study the Bible, and to understand their identity in Christ. And because of that, they become limited in their knowledge. You know, one of the passions that Paul the Apostle had for the Christians, especially in Ephesus, was that he wanted them to understand their Christian faith. He wanted them to understand the depth of their, of their faith, the, 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 the power of their faith, and he prayed for them. And I wanted you guys to see this. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. I love this prayer because Paul, you could tell his heart was just so pumped for these Christians to grasp who they are in Christ, to grasp their amazing faith. In chapter 1 of Ephesians, at verse 17, notice what he says here. He says, he says, I pray, making prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceedingly greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. And he says, far above all principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in, the, in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave, to him, uh, gave him to be the head over all things to, to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Notice that Paul's heart in verse 17 of chapter 1 of Ephesians, he says, I'm praying that God may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That's a good prayer to pray for yourself. I want to go deeper, Lord. I want to understand you more. Because nobody in this place is ever going to get to a place in their Christian life where you're going to say, I already know everything to know, uh, that there is to know about Jesus. I already know everything about the Christian life. Nobody will ever get to that point. And we see here that Paul himself prayed that the Christians would be enlightened. They, get, they would go deeper and understand the faith that they, they have in Christ. Because our faith in Christ is amazing. Our faith in Christ is powerful. And Paul says, I don't want you guys to miss it. And it's sad that there are a lot of Christians today who are very shallow in their understanding of their own faith in Christ. They're not growing. They're not understanding Christ too much except just John 3.16. That God died for me on the cross. Nothing wrong with that, but there's more beyond the cross, right? There's more beyond the cross that Christ wants to show us, and that's what Paul prayed. So the question that I want to answer tonight, one of the questions, or one of the uh, yeah, questions that I want to answer is, who are you in Christ? Well, the answer to that is, you are a new person. According to 2 Corinthians 5.17, you are a new person. That's pretty simple, right? 
Well, what do you mean by a new person? Well, this is what I'm going to dissect chapter 5, verse 17 for you tonight. I'm just going to expound on this one verse because this verse has so much. And I'm not even going to do justice. Honestly, I'm, not even, I'm barely going to touch the surface here because this verse has so much in it that because of our time, I'm going to try to pull out as much as I can. So let's look at verse 17. He says very clearly, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Very first word, therefore. The word therefore refers back to verses 14 and si through 16, where Paul tells us that all believers have died with Christ and no longer live for themselves. I think that is the very first thing that a Christian, a born-again believer, a brand-new Christian should understand that they're no longer living for themselves. You have lost your rights. There's nothing wrong with that. I know today we're, we're, we're fighting for that, right? It's our rights. But when it comes to the Christian faith, having God call the shots is not bad. It's okay with that. I'm okay. And we see here clearly that Paul says that our lives are, are no longer worldly. We are, we are now spiritual people. We're spiritual people. We have been awakened spiritually. And I love that part. We have been awakened spiritually. So, therefore... Anyone in Christ, notice what he says, anyone in Christ. This is another thing that's important to establish right away, that this truth are for those in Christ. Now, that's very important. Those who are born again. You see, a non-Christian cannot experience what Paul here is talking about here. They cannot experience transformation until they are united with Christ. Until they're united with Christ. Listen to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2.14. He says, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Have you ever had a conversation with a non-Christian and you try to explain to them the, 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 your relationship with Christ and they kind of look at you like you're crazy? They're like, really? You really believe in this stuff? See, to us it's real, it's life. But to a non-Christian, they look at you like, what are you talking about? We see here very clearly that this is for those who are in Christ. And notice, this is also a promise to everyone. Anyone that is united in Christ will become new. I mean, God is a very creative God. If you haven't noticed that as you read your Bibles, God is very creative. A creative God can reach the most hopeless, dark, darkest, lowliest, the worst, and the farthest away. And he can reach them and he can make them new, completely new. You know, as we come closer to the end of the year, there are a lot of people today looking for change in their lives. Perhaps some of you in here are doing that, are probably looking forward to that. There are people today, they, they want to experience newness, something different in my life. I am tired of living the way I've, I've been living. 2015 has been just nothing but problems and, and issues. I want to do something different. There's, there's a desire in people to want to have new things in their lives. And they begin to change their lives. Perhaps they want to change jobs. I'm tired of working here. I've been here for 10 years. It's time for me to move on. Or perhaps it's to have a, a promotion. I've been here for 10 years and I need to make more money. Therefore, I'm going to hit up my boss and say, I need a promotion. Something new, something changing. Or maybe it's maybe getting out of a relationship. You've been in this relationship too long, and they're not asking you to marry them. It's over. Actually, that, I had a question like that uh, just this past week. And they said, you know, this, this guy I'm dating, this is a girl, young girl, like 30. It's like, you know, I've been with them and this and that, and I think we're, we're meant for each other. I feel God has said, yes, this is the man. And he says, no. <laughs> so it's like, so I broke up with him, you know. Something new, I'm changing, this is it, I'm done. Maybe it's a relationship on your end. Or perhaps maybe it's the other way around where you're like, you know what, this year, 2016, I am going to find a husband. I'm going to find a wife. This is it, I'm done being single. You want something new. The newness, a change. And we see very clearly that people can change things on the outside, but they won't change things on the inside. You can change a lot of stuff on the outside. But when it comes to the inside, the person, only God can do that. Only God can cause a change like that. And that is why Paul says, anyone in Christ, notice, what, what is he? A new creation. 
We become members of a new creation. You know, the rabbis actually used this term to describe those whose sins um, had been forgiven. But this is not what Paul has in mind. Paul understood this, this whole phrase in what Jews used, the rabbis. But Paul has in mind God bringing the new creation into existence by sending Christ into this old creation to transform it or to reconcile it. That's what he's doing. That's what he's thinking about here. He's talking about Christ coming here to offer something new, which is pretty cool, pretty radical, to be honest with you. And I love this fact. Notice what he says here in verse 17. He says, if anyone is in Christ, he is. He is. This is a for sure thing. And Paul doesn't say, I think they're going to become new creations. I hope they do. He says, no, those who are in Christ, he says, they become new creations. He is a new creation. This is a fact. You know, there are many things in the Christian life that are for sure. And this is one of them here. This is something you can count on. The person that you're witnessing to, when they come to Christ, you can promise them confidently with boldness to say, you know what, you are now a new creation. That's something that the Bible gives us the authority to say, because that's what it says here. He is a new creation. Now, there are other things in Scripture that are for sure, that you can count on, that I can say to you, this is God's will. This is what we see in Scripture. Let me give you some examples. John 14, verses 1, through, uh, 1 2, and 3, it says very clearly that Jesus is coming back for you. He's coming back for you. He's not going to forget about you. He is coming back for you. That's, that's an assurance that we have as Christians, is that Jesus said it very clearly. I go and prepare a place for you, and when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back. I will come back. That's awesome, isn't it? That's kind of comforting. My dad used to do that when I was little, and I was left. I, I, I went to a private school, Catholic school, and I hated school. I think I shared this story with you, so I'm going to be quick. But I, I hated school. I didn't want to go to school. And I would cry, throw up, and all of that stuff as a little boy. I hated it, right? So I get in there, and my dad drops me off, and I just said, you can't leave me. And he would always say to me, I'm coming back. And so that kind of helped me out a little bit. I still threw up a couple times during the day, throughout the day, but, but, it still, but it helped me out. My dad's words, I'm coming back. So as I went to school, went through my classes and whatnot, at the end of the day, maybe about 30 minutes before the bell rang, my dad would show up at the window because it was this big window. I was sitting down, and I remember the window was to my right, and it was right there. And the moment I saw my dad, man, I got so excited. My dad came back. That's so cool. He, he promised to be back, and he, he's back. Well, listen, Jesus promised that he'll be back for you. He's coming back, and he's going to come back to take you. That's a for sure thing we have in Scripture. Another thing that we have for sure in Scripture is in Philippians 1.6, that the work that God started in you he will complete it. Isn't that great? Now, yeah, sometimes you're like, I, I feel like, man, there's so much going on in my life. Is, really, is he really going to finish this, <laughs> you know, this work? Yeah, he promised. Philippians 1, 6, he who began a good work in you will complete it. See, the Bible wouldn't use such strong terms if it wasn't sure. So God will complete the work that he's doing in you right now. You know, the cool thing is that every person sitting here, God is doing something different in you. And he's going to complete the work he's doing in you. That's so cool. And God is so unique, so creative that he's doing so many different things in your lives. And the, and the confidence that we have in Scripture is that he's going to complete it. Here's another thing that's for sure in Scripture. James 1.5, he says, when we lack wisdom, God will give you wisdom if you ask for it. How many of you here have lacked wisdom in life? Everybody better be, I mean, come on, if you don't, woo. I'm going to see a long line right here talking to me. How do you do that? Listen, when we lack wisdom, and we do, I lack wisdom every single day in situations, in decisions I have to make. I said, God, I am stuck. I honestly need some wisdom here. God will give you wisdom. And he has a cool way to giving you wisdom. It's very unique because the Holy Spirit will counsel you. And all of a sudden, you feel this tug heading in this direction, and you're like, Oh, this is the way you're supposed to go. It's like God gives you the wisdom, the direction of what you need to do. And it's so natural, but yet supernatural. That's the thing that blows me away. God doesn't speak to me through clouds and lightnings and things like that. There's just so simple things, but I recognize that God is in this. That's the cool thing. So I like wisdom. You like wisdom. Listen, when you lack wisdom, 
You go to prayer, say, God, I am stuck. I need your wisdom. He will give it to you because he promised you. That's what it says in James 1.5. Here's another for sure thing. John 3.16. Very clear that if you trust in Christ, heaven is for you. You have your way to heaven, your ticket to heaven. It's not a maybe, but if you become born again, as Jesus says in John 3.16, listen, you have, you will have your entrance into heaven. That's a for sure thing. You don't have to wrestle with your thoughts in your mind. Am I going to go to heaven? Am I not going to go to heaven? What's going on? This, listen, it's a for sure thing if you are a born again believer. That's what God says. So Paul says here, he is a new creation. It's a fact. It's, it's a promise. This is what will happen. Now, this whole new creation, this concept of new creation, it freaks people out sometimes. It does. Because the, the, the conversations that, that I've had with people, sometimes people don't like new things. People don't like new things. That's called neophobia. Maybe you're neophobic today. And what that means is basically the fear of anything new. Anything new. And some of you probably have that. If I were to move around your chairs here, you'd probably freak out, right? You're like, wait, that was my ch-. I mean, you know, I mean, as far as when it comes to church, right? It's like, this is my seat. I don't want nothing else. But that's beyond that. That's, that's really low practically. But what I'm talking about here, though, a neophobic, a person who hates or fears anything that's new. You know, when I talk to people who don't know Christ, and, and most of the time when they reject Jesus, the reason why they reject Jesus is because they don't want nothing changed in their lives. They're afraid of a new life. They don't want God in their life. Why? Because it's going to bring something new. It's going to change their habits. It's going to change their passions. It's going to change all of the things that they're doing, even their addictions that they're comfortable with. They don't want to go to God. They don't want God in their lives because they know that things will change. They don't want that new stuff. And, and most of the time, it's because of that that they don't come to Christ. And like I said, there are some Christians, I believe, who are neophobic. They don't like to be changed. They don't like new things. They become new creations in Christ, but they don't want to experience anything else new. It's almost like, listen, just give me my ticket to heaven, God, and I will just sit here and wait for you. Don't change anything in my life. Don't make me do things that are new. I want to stay in my comfort zone. But we have a problem with that, or you'll have a problem with that, because God is into new things. He's always looking for for doing new things. So how... Are Christians a new creation? In what sense are we new? Well, first of all, let me add this, that it is God who creates new things in us. You and I do not have the power to create something new in our lives. It's God. That's his creative power. He does it himself. We don't have that power. It's his job. It's his work. God created something entirely fresh and unique, and that's you. You and I are a fresh work of God. And we continue to be a fresh work of God. That's the cool thing about it. You see, God did not reform us. He did not rehabilitate us. We have completely become new and transformed. This is the whole thing about what Paul is trying to uh, make us understand and trying to uh, communicate to us, that God didn't just clean us up, patch us up, and says, okay, now you're new. No, listen, Christ has made you and I brand new, brand new. You know what that means? You know what it means to have something new? When you go from an old car to a brand new car, you know, that, you know, you know that, 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 that feel, that experience of driving a new car versus your 1990 whatever, Oldsmobile? Not that I don't like Oldsmobiles. If you do have one, I'm not, you know, knocking down on your car. But, but you know what I'm saying? I mean, to get into a brand new car, you know, the smell of a new car, the, the, the nice seats, and you can't even hear the road because everything's so new. There's not a creak in it. There's no, nothing, there's no cracking, nothing. It's just brand new. Listen, your life has become brand new. God did not just patch you up, put a Band-Aid here, Band-Aid there. Oh, there's a leak here. Oh, there we go. It's done. <laughs> he didn't do that. He literally made you new. And, 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 and he did not reform us, like I said, but he actually made us new. Now, what do you have that's brand new? Well, what you have is this. You have a new desire for the things of God. You have a brand new desire for the things of God. You did not have it before. Well, Robert, I was a religious person. Yeah, so was I. 
and, and there were some things that intrigued me about God, but I never had the desire for the things that I have now when it comes to those things about God. It was, it was totally different. Yeah, I, I was curious about God, but, but being on this side now, on this end, it's totally different. The desire is totally new. Well, what kind of desires do I have now? Well, people will have a new desire to know more of Jesus, to know more of Jesus. He's becoming exciting in your life. You're not just satisfied with knowing John 3.16 and just your basic things, but now you're like, I want to know more of Christ. I want to get to know him more. I want to study him. And you begin to kind of study God. What else do you have new for, or desire, I'm sorry, for the, new things, for, for the things of God? Well, another thing that you have is that you have a desire to read and study the Bible. The Bible has become your newspaper. The Bible has become your devotional. The Bible has become your life manual. Do you remember before you were a Christian, did the Bible really come into play in your life? Probably not, right? Somebody might have handed you a Bible like, oh, so you thumb through it and you're like, oh, this is kind of cool. But now the Bible has become something more. Now you just can't wait to come to church to hear the Bible taught. You can't wait to get home to study a little bit more. We have so many resources, like I shared with you. We have our chapel store with so many resources for you to, to buy and to use at, at your own personal time to learn more of God's word. That desire is brand new. You do not have it before. I did not have it before, but you do now. You also have a desire to talk to God. There's a comfort in knowing that you can talk to God. Have you ever find yourself just pouring out your heart to the Lord? Just sometimes you're driving or you're at home or whatever, and you're just like, Lord... And you just, and then you catch it like, wow, I'm, I'm talking to God. This is cool. But there's a comfort. There's a peace that comes upon your own life because you know he's listening. And you're not just talking up in the air. You're not just trying to, you know, create this God in your mind. There's something real about it. And it's so cool. When you can carry on conversations with God, there's a desire in your heart. When you're going through a problem or an issue, whatever it is, the first thing that comes to your mind is I need to talk to God. Perhaps I need to talk to somebody who knows God. I mean, all of a sudden, things change. And not only that, but you also have a desire, a new desire, to be with God's people. Church has become important to you. You come corporately to gather together, to fellowship, to meet people, other uh, Christians and all of that, and it's one of those things that you like to do. It's a new desire. And another thing is that you have a desire, a new desire, to pray over people. All of a sudden, you care for people, people that are hurting, you know, so cool, my little four-year-old, sometimes when we're driving and there's an accident or something's going on, the first thing she'll say to my mom, my mom, my wife, not my mom, my <laughs> wife, I'm thinking of mommy, okay? She'll say, mommy, daddy, pray. Four-year-old, that's so awesome that she even understands the importance of praying over people when they're hurting. That's so cool. And that's the desire that we have as Christians, as a new creation, is that all of a sudden, we're praying over people that are hurting, people that you don't even know. You know, when I see a high-speed chase, I'll pray for that person. Lord, in Jesus' name, just have them stop before they get shot or something. You know, have them stop. Protect the people that are, that are you know, that they're flying by and, and all this. I mean, I, I just begin to pray because it's actual live. It's, it's actually live right there. We begin to pray for people. It's a new desire that we have. Another thing that we have, another new thing, is that we desire to sing praises to God. Your love for Jesus is not only expressed through the, the study of his word, but now you just want to sing to him. And you don't, it doesn't matter if you know how to sing, huh? It doesn't matter. Go in your car, roll up your window, man, pop in that CD. You're singing, you're thinking, man, i got to be with this Hillsong group because I sound really good. <laughs> right? It doesn't matter how you sound, you know what I mean? And even when we come here corporately, you know, you just sing. You just sing into the Lord, and it's something that you do because it's a new desire that you have. You like singing to God. It's a way of expressing your, your, your thankfulness and your worship. And lastly, you have a new desire to see others right with God. You don't want people to go to hell. You hear somebody who's sick, first thing that comes to your mind, are they, are they Christian? Are they born again? You want people to come to heaven. You want your family members, your friends. You don't want them just to be left behind. You, you want to see them in heaven because hell, we know, is a reality. I like what David said in Psalm 73, verse 25. Whom have I in heaven but you? 
and there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that what happened when you became a new creation? All of a sudden, your desires changed, and now you're like, Lord, you are my desire now. You have become my prime desire. Now, in saying all of that, I just want to remind you that, that at its root, Christianity is all about what God did for us, not what we can do or should do for God. He did it all. It was him who put that desire in you. It was him who transformed your life. And you're just basically responding to the work of the Holy Spirit. It was totally his work. You couldn't conjure up your own desire for God. It was you're a sinful person and you needed a savior, Christ, to intervene in your life. Our, our new identity in Christ should be recognizable both to ourselves and to others. That's important. Here's where I have a hang up. This is where I get kind of, I guess, um, I don't know what word to use, but anyways, I'm just thinking, you know, uh, people that say they're Christians and, and there's no evidence in their lives. I, I, I never judge people eternally because God can always give people a chance to, to get right with him. But when somebody says very confidently that I'm a Christian and, and there's no fruit, nothing in their life would tell me that they're connected to Christ, I have a hard time with it. And I try not to be judgmental. I try not to be mean but I try to explain that a Christian, there's got to be some evidence, something in them, even if it's a little thing, that they're connected to Christ, that they're united in Christ. Because if they're not showing any kind of evidence, then it's either one, they're not saved, or two, they don't understand Jesus. They don't know what it means to be a Christian. If we are in Christ, it should be evidence, just as being in the world is Equiv uh, equally evident. I mean, don't you know the people that are in the world, right? It's pretty evident, right? I mean, really, it is. When you look at somebody totally living for themselves, you're like, yep, humanism, there it is. And you see a Christian who says, I'm a Christian, yet they're still living in this humanistic way. You're thinking, I I'm having a hard time here. Because I could tell a worldly person, I, I, I yep, that that's the person who's not connected to Christ. But if a person says, I'm a Christian, yet they're acting like them, there's a problem there. We pray for them. We love them. Our identity in Christ should be recognizable both to ourselves and to others. You know, this past week, I ran into this young guy, early 20s. He just got saved recently. And um, basically, he was uh, at work. I was working, and um, he was at the station, K-Wave, and I was there talking to the guy. And, and I just went out as I was leaving, going home, he, he followed me and we were talking on our way out and he's explaining to me his new life in Christ. Amazing. I mean, this guy was just on fire. Jesus is my life now. I am done living for myself and this and that. And he's just going on and on and on and on and on. And he was just sharing with me. And of course, at first I'm thinking, oh man, you know, this guy's kind of like tripping out on me here. You know what I mean? I, I, you know, it's just, it's weird. I don't know why I thought that, but but then as, as he was talking and talking, and he's, he's really being genuine about it. And as we get out towards the parking lot, as I'm leaving, I said, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to get home, you know what I mean? And he just kept talking. I said, hey, man, keep it up, dude. He goes, yeah, and the other thing, too, is, you know, I quit weed. I did weed last week, but now it's gone. You know, here's this guy, 20 years old, totally on fire for God. And then I said, oh, man, well, keep it up, man. Stay close to Jesus. Okay. As I'm walking away, he goes, hey, can I just have a hug? <laughs> I was like, sure, <laughs> you know? And it's like, this guy was totally excited for Christ. That's evidence right there. Something happened. Definitely something happened. And yet we see here that Paul is saying that, you know what, when you're a new creation, something changes in your life. Paul the Apostle is a great example, to be, to, 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 to be honest with you here. He was a great example in Acts chapter 9. We knew exactly where his passion was. He hated Christians. He wanted them dead. He wanted them imprisoned. And after his conversion, what happened? He began to pray for Christians, love Christians. I mean, all these things that he was actually doing was just amazing because he was literally transformed. God changed his life. It was evident to the rest of the people there. So now what does he say? Notice it says here in verse 17, anyone in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things 
have passed away. Old things have passed away. Guys, listen, this is huge, okay? Huge. The old refers to everything that is part of our old nature. Natural pride, love of sin, reliance on works, and our former opinions, habits, passions, especially the supreme love of ourselves, and self-righteousness, self-promotion, self-justification. All things. The word old things in the Greek is just one word. And the Greek word means antiques or the original lifestyle. It means that something is really old. It doesn't refer to things that you have given up since you've come to Christ. Because this word in the Greek doesn't refer to this generation or past generation. The word is always used for something that is ancient or old, really old. So what is he saying here? Well, he's basically talking about something that is ancient. Uh, this word actually was used or is used in Scripture by Jesus. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, when Jesus said, You have heard of what was said of those of old, speaking of the patriarchs, of the prophets. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, same word is used, speaking of Satan, that serpent of old, something that was way back. So it does not necessarily refer to your past, but to your entire world old sin nature it's old which is much older than you it's much older than you listen to this romans 5 19 for as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous this is important because this is what paul says has passed by it's passed by. The word pass means to disappear or to come to an end. Now, I'm going to explain this to you because I'm sure you're thinking, wait, but sin still in my life. There's still, we're living in a fallen world. I'll explain this in a moment. But this has passed away. It's disappearing. It's disappeared. It has disappeared. Uh, for example, Revelation 21, verse 1. I saw the new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Fast forwarding up to the Revelation 21, our future life, our future world, this world will pass away. It will literally disappear. It's gone. We can't go back to it. A day is coming when everything will disappear. Well, all the stuff that we see, we're going to experience this. All the evil that we experience now, all the suffering will be gone. It will pass away. And you know, that's why John actually encouraged us in 1 John 2, 17, don't love the world. Remember that? Well, why, John? Because the world is what? Passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. This stuff is just going to be gone. So all things have passed away. All things have passed away. You know, when Jesus came to earth, he divided history into two sections. Uh, before Christ and after Christ. Uh, the B.C. years, I call them the B.C. years before Christ. When I was not in Christ, those days are gone. Those days are completely gone. I cannot go back. I don't want to go back to Robert Baltadano I don't know, 18 years ago. That's my old life. That, that's gone. What Paul here has in mind is more than just our past. Our old position in Adam. Our old position in Adam that brought spiritual death, slavery, bondage, all has passed away. What do you mean, Robert? That means that you are no longer held captive to sin. It's gone. See, that was part of your identity in Adam. You were in Adam before you were in Christ. You were a sinner. You were a person who was destined to hell. You were an object of wrath. Remember in Ephesians? All of this stuff was your position in Adam, but now, Paul says, you are a new creation. That has passed away. You're no longer in Adam. Now your identity is in who? In Christ. It's in Christ. Our old position. The presence of sin is still a reality. Don't get me wrong. This is where I'm thinking you guys are like, does it mean that we can live perfectly? No. Perfection will never be accomplished on this side of heaven until you get into heaven and you leave this body. But, but what I'm trying to say is that sin has lost its power. Sin has lost its power. It's no longer, it no longer has authority over you unless you give it authority. Do you know that? 
unless you give it authority. If you give death, or I'm sorry, sin, authority in your life, it will take you for a ride. And, and some of you know what I'm talking about here. We live in Christ. We strive to honor Christ. We'll never be sinless. But as we get older in Christ, we will sin less. We will know those areas that we were caught all the time. Now those things are kind of distant. Those things are just moving away from us because we're smarter. We know what it's like. But now it's different. And this is what Paul is trying to communicate to us, that this has passed away. And because your identity is no longer in Adam, what really has passed away is death. Death has passed away. Spiritual death. You know that you will never experience spiritual death? If you are a born-again believer here tonight, you are not going to experience death spiritually. You're going to still experience physical death. That's something that we're all going to go through. But spiritual death will no longer apply to you. I think that's kind of cool. I mean, this is what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 54. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in what? Victory. Isn't that great? It's awesome. You're secure. You're, it's settled. Because you no longer identify in Adam, but now you're in Christ's. That's the power of the Holy Spirit and what Christ has done in your life. Now, let's come back to earth. The circumstances of life sometimes can cloud our view so that we won't recognize the reality of being a new creation. Because you're like, you know what, Robert? I don't feel like a new creation, dude. I'm telling you right now. Well, you know what? Circumstances, issues, sometimes will kind of block us from understanding that, that new creation. We don't feel new. The struggle of our, uh, with our old nature is for real. But the cool thing is that we've been given a different nature, the nature of Christ, which is sinless, which is righteousness. And now we have two things that we're wrestling with. You have your old nature, but you have Christ in you. And those two natures, what? Will clash, right? This is where the struggle is. This is where the battle is. And we're going to battle this till the end of, the, of, of our lives. Listen to what Paul said in Galatians 5.17. For the flesh lusts after the spirit, against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. How many of you guys know what I'm talking about? There's a desire to want to do right for God, but there's always something that comes against you, right? Your flesh, perhaps as a friend. You know, you're here, you're taking in the scriptures, you're like excited, you're like, oh man, this is good, I can't wait to get home and, and talk to God. And you get home, or you're on your way, and somebody texts you, and they want you to go out to a bar tonight. And all of a sudden, your flesh begins, to, oh, well, you know, I did go to church. All of a sudden, there's a wrestling, there's a, there's a struggle all of a sudden. That's because there's a war going on. See, the, the nature of Christ is telling you, read my word, talk to me, serve me, stay in righteousness. And your nature, your, your, your sinful nature is saying, don't go there, come here. And there's this tug of war, but it's really not a tug of war. The moment you yield to the Holy Spirit, it's, it's a done deal. You, you will have victory. We're the ones that cause this to become a struggle because we have that tendency to always be leaning towards doing things that are not right. So he says it here very clearly that your position in Adam has passed away because now you're in Christ with new desires. You're a new creation. And this is why he said here, he says, behold. I love that. He explodes there in verse 17. He says, behold, all things have become new. It's a sudden note of triumph and wonderment. Behold, he says, all things have become new. We are brand new people. This newness is a continual action. It's everlasting. It doesn't grow old within time. Christianity does not grow old. Your faith in Christ doesn't grow old. When you hear people say, you know, I've been a Christian for 50 years, and eh, it's just boring. It's kind of old. It was exciting back when I was 20, but now it's not. That's not Christianity. Because Christianity will never grow old. You know what I'm saying? So when you hear people say that, you're like, you lost it there, sir, ma'am. Because the wonderful thing about being saved is that you and I get to experience not only a new life, but we get to experience a new work that God is doing in our lives daily. He's doing something new daily. 
That's a great thing, is that God is on, he's, he's into new, doing new work. He's always looking for new things to do in us practically. That is why Paul says we are all a workmanship. Remember that in Ephesians 2.10? We are his workmanship, created in who? Christ Jesus for good works. We're his workmanship. He is constantly doing something new. You're a work of art that he keeps doing. He keeps working with you. That's the hope that we have as Christians. No matter if you're 20 or you're 60 or 80, it doesn't matter. He's doing a new work in your life. That's who God is. He wants to do new things in your life. So to conclude, the new creation is a wondrous thing formed in the mind of God and created by his power for his glory. That the things we once loved, we once held dear to us, we now detest, part of the new creation. The sin we once held on to, we now desire to put away forever. We are experiencing a newness in life daily. And as we transition into our communion tonight, let that be an exciting thing for you tonight. As we reflect back on the death of Christ, because of what he did on the cross, you are now new people. And because of that, we should be thankful. We should, this, this communion should have a totally different experience for you personally. Because you can thank God for sending Jesus to die on the cross for you. And we can thank him together as we take this communion. We can praise God because the old has passed away. You are no longer in Adam. You are now in Christ's. You are no longer objects of wrath, but you're objects of God's love, objects of God's grace. And as we come together here to do this celebration of communion, just remember, you have a lot to be thankful for. And not only that, but it's something for you to to spend time personally and say, Lord, continue 